Thank you, Austin, for the kind words, and I'm pretty excited. Uh, this is for from the trainees to for the trainees uh, and junior residents. I, I always learn a lot at this meeting. So let's talk about this new specialty in medicine, um, VR endovascular, kind of interventional surgery. The more I do this, I recognize this is really just a surgical field. It is not an imaging field. It is a surgical field. Um, the program director is, um, as Austin said, of the VIR residency at KPLAMC or Bisla. So what is VIR? It is minimally invasive. And I think as we continue to move forward, we're going to be utilizing more and more computer technology, more and more advancements in science, and we're going to try to be less and less invasive. It's surgical. It is truly a surgical field. It's just a modern day surgery. It is the future of surgery now. And I think that's an important key that you have to understand. We are altering the human body, right? Physiologically and mechanically. And we work, what's most exciting is we work head to toe. One day I'm in the brain this last week was fixing a brachiocephalic extent in a patient who had diffuse global uh, hypoperfusion, um, getting arm axis, groin axis, crossing it, doing angios of the carotid and the subclavian vertebrals, uh, along with my neuro colleagues. And the other day I'm in the foot vessels working in the toe or in the liver or the kidney or even the prostate, all kind of within the week. So that's what's pretty exciting. Now, the blood vessel is my highway to do head to toe surgery. So you can look at the circulation from a wrist artery or anywhere in the, from the toe, I can go anywhere to the head. We just need long enough, tiny enough catheters and wires to do it. But that's what I do. The circulation is all interconnected. In fact, lymphatics, arteries, veins. So a lot of my work is through that. Now, why did the word kind of radiology kind of develop? Why did it develop from radiology? Well, a couple of these kind of pioneers and innovators enable that. Okay. One is Sven Iver Seldinger. Um, he was a, a Swedish radiologist who published this pretty exciting uh, technique, which is simple, but just like the fire or the wheel are par like paradigm shifters. Um, and in active radiology in 1953, he basically figured out a way to use this kind of stylet and needle to put a wire through that hollow stylet into the vessel before you had to cut open the, um, the groin expose the vessels after dissecting the fascia, et cetera, and then poke, uh, then make a, an incision in the artery, vessel loops, and then do the picture taking. He was able to do it through the skin. So local, put a needle in that had a hollow end, blood came out, put a wire through it, pulled the needle out, put a catheter. We do that everywhere in the world now. And these are the pictures he was able to take and this published in his original article that you can look up in Active Radiology in 1953. And again, it's just this needle in, wire through that hollow needle, pull the needle out, put a catheter in. And we use that Seldon technique throughout. But really, we didn't think, we just did it to take pictures and diagnose stuff. Changed, the, the world changed when this gentleman, Carl's theater daughter, had a vision that we could do a surgery without a scalpel, all right? So in 1964, he became the father of vascular eventual surgery, the first endovascular surgeon the first critical limb ischemia fighter, okay? In 1964, there was a lady who was 82 years old, bad heart, who was only offered an amputation because she had digital toe gangrene, dead toes. And she, was, she said, no, I wanna live, I wanna leave the earth the way I came in with both my feet, both my legs. And she was just too sick to do open surgery. So daughter, for the first time ever, was able to cross this blockage in the, in the thigh and open it up with sequential Teflon dilators. And so the first endovascular surgery was performed January 16, 1964, almost 60 years ago. And he prophesized that the angiographic catheter can be more than a tool for passive means for diagnosis with imagination and innovation that can become an important surgical instrument. And my goodness, did that happen today? It mm -hmm. certainly has. Now, there's a field of innovators that have, that, that, that is part of our ethos. And it's not just daughter, he started the process, but his fellow Judkins learned a way to do, evaluate the heart, made his own special catheters using a Bunsen burner and cath and Teflon catheters. They're still used to this day, the Judkins right, Judkins left, named after Melvin Judkins. Um, in 1968, Joseph Roche, who came from, who's so enamored by what daughter was doing, came from some Czechoslovakia, to work at the Oregon Health Science University and the daughter, uh, now known as the Daughter Institute in Portland, Oregon, and did the first embolization for a GI bleeder. Um, Grunsik was an angiologist who also listened closely to Daughter and developed the first coronary angioplasty in the 1970s. 
this guy, Ron Nicola Pinto, a physician, developed the liver bypass. So instead of doing an open surgery where they had a high mortality and people died, he was able to do it through a neck incision where you just need a Band-Aid to put a bypass. Julio Palmas, and I'll talk about later in my aortic talk, developed the balloon expandable stent, which now if you have a blockage, you put this in and every like patient, everyone in this audience will have a family member who has this in their heart. Some family member, aunt, uncle, somebody's going to have this. So the beauty of what we do is it's not one single organ. We're in the vascular space. We're in the kidney space. We're in the, you know, the cancer space. We're in the stroke space. We're in the men's and women's health space. We're in the intestine. We're everywhere in the human body. And that's what keeps exciting. We are not uh, de-differentiated. We, we're totally potential. And I think that's one of the more exciting things that we have. Now, what are our basic tools or needles, wires, microcatheters, balloons, you know, a bunch of words, but basically it's, again, using that same cell degree technique, we get access into some organ throughout the body. Using uh, field cytopation. And then we use a different wire. And there's different shapes, like Judkin's one with own catheters and it's shapes. There's different shapes with different vessels in the different people's anatomy that we can utilize to do the surgeries that we do. So these are just some of the names, Davis, Visceral, Nicholson, Simmons too, et cetera. So the, all these, the, you know, the Roche, she developed a whole slew of catheters, Cobra is made by Judkins. These are all catheters that we can use throughout the human body from head to toe to, to catheters that are smaller and smaller and more specific and bridges and track anywhere, like I said, from the tip of the brain to the tip of the toe, to the tip of the liver, to the tip of the kidney. Anyway, it's going to traverse and, uh, and it's pretty exciting. Snares, so we can remove foreign bodies just like a cowboy uses a lasso. We, as vascular and vessel surgeons, use uh, lassos inside the vessels or inside different organs and remove uh, stones, remove uh, foreign bodies, and things that are not meant to be there. We can take it out with this. And we have different stents. And this is a tip stent, which is a viator, and it's kind of like this. And basically it has a covered component and a bare component to keep the portal vein open. So these are all things that we have as far as technology goes. These are balloons um, to crack open plaques throughout the human body um, and different kind of uh, things. So what do we do? We do vascular uh, procedures, um, blood clots in the legs, in the heart. We prevent clots from going to the heart by putting in filters in the, into the big vein that drains into the heart. We can fix varicose veins that can be both cosmetic and painful. We can open up complete blockages of the vein. There's so much we can do. We fix aneurysms in the aorta or, or blockages in the aorta and uh, prevent gangrene and limb loss. So these are all pretty exciting. Um, stroke therapy. We also do a lot of brain work. A lot of neuro or peripheral vascular interventionists are doing stroke therapy throughout the country and throughout the world. We're also having combined training programs of peripheral and neurovascular. In seven years, you can get dual certified like the Mount Sinai program. We also fix aneurysms in the brain and blockages in the, in the carotid artery. I did one in the brachiocephalic this past week and a patient of mine that I extended her subclavian artery to improve circulation to her, her heart, which had a lima bypass, but also to her brain. We also do kiddos. We do pediatric uh, interventions and, um, uh, you know, for vascular disorders or different things, you know, cancer and kids and stuff. We also do a lot more and more men's and women's health, both for prostate issues and fibroid issues. You're going to hear a lot of this stuff and even reproductive things, patients of infertility, we can help them. So a slew of things that we're able to do. Um, and we're doing more and more orthopedic uh, surgical procedures, whether it be spine and joint and pelvis or pain and palliative and in the cancer patient population and a lot of cancer work. We also deal with a lot of emergencies. Patients are coughing up blood, bleeds from the intestines, bleeds from after giving birth. Some people bleed profusely and it's a common cause of uh, uh, female mortality that we're able to be heavily involved and prevent traumas either from stabbings or gunshots, but a lot of it's car accidents um, and sometimes from what we do. So this is an example of the aneurysm uh, stent graft uh, or uh, abdominal stent graft that we use. And basically it's a specialized graft that we put in the human body and that enables us to fix it. This is one of my patients who had a ruptured iliac aneurysm and we were able to get across, deploy some blockages and coils, inject some gas to take pictures because our kidneys weren't so hot 
and put in a stent graft. This is years ago, and she uh, recovered within a day or two and was sent home. And, like nothing happened, even though she had, you know, the mortality of this and is historically about ninety percent. This is the CAT scan showing the aneurysms excluded from the circulation. And again, she did quite well. And we do this all percutaneously with local anesthesia and some moderate amount of uh, sedation like uh, benzodiazepines. And so we can do this, getting some background noise. Um, we can do this pretty minimally invasive. And at the end, they just leave a Band-Aid, pretty exciting. This is that, that shunt I was telling you about, the bypass circuit. So we basically go through the, the neck, through the heart, into the liver veins, and we stab a needle uh, under all image guidance into the portal vein, and then we make a bypass. So we basically bypass the hard liver, and so patients stop bleeding or stop developing fluid in the belly. This is a Google Emmy developed this 3D, this detachable coil that has this very soft and 3D shape. There's different diameters, different lengths, different widths, and different uh, stiffness. And this is a patient that I assisted with years ago where had an intracranial aneurysm, and those can bleed into the brain and cause herniation, can cause stroke, can cause you know death and and uh, and uh, uh, major morbidity. And we were able to fix this little thing here by putting some metal coils in there and prevent rupture, or even if it's ruptured, we can fix it. And it used to, you'd have to crack the skull open, they'd have drainage catheters in, recovering the ICU. This, they recover much more rapidly. So it's pretty exciting, this evolution. We also have so many devices to remove blood clot. This is what's called the penumbra device with separators where you can get it all the way up to the brain and remove clot. This is one of my patients that I assisted in a years ago where we uh, had a patient who was young in his 20s or 30s who had what's called locking syndrome, couldn't walk, talk, eat, move, could only, you know, really could understand, but couldn't uh, communicate. Terrible. It's called locking syndrome with 90% mortality it's from a clot in the, what's called the basal artery, which is the back, feeds the back of the brain. We put this device in and this is no flow and this is flow. And you can see after that, he was able to walk. Um, he was able to move his hands be able to talk on the table. Pretty exciting. We used this older device called the Mercy concentric device and removed this thrombus back then, but you can see there's no flow, flow. Dark spot here, open, pretty exciting. We open up blockages throughout the body. This is a patient who lost her left kidney. She was on five blood pressure meds because she was developing a lot of renin. And because of that renin, she couldn't, she, she couldn't be controlled. And we crossed it with a wire, put a stent here and Flow is great. And the beauty is I follow these patients in the office with duplex ultrasounds, making sure that the, the kidney artery stent is not re on a yearly basis. So I follow these patients for life. So that's also great to be able to have that established follow for patients for your career. And I, I, that's part of the things I would never want to give up and I really enjoy the clinic and seeing patients and touching them up as they need to touch up. This is a, a truck driver who came in with a cold leg because he had showered clot to his leg and he was lost circulation to his foot. So he had, this is the reason, the aneurysm in his back of his knee that was trashing clot to his leg. And so I was able to get across it, put a covered stent in, similar to this Viator, you know, like this, a covered stent, excluded the aneurysm, and then dripped some clot busting medication. This is actually a cancer patient of mine who had a difficulty walking and he wanted to play with his grandkids. And he couldn't because of this blockage in his, in his pelvis, right above his hip joint. So uh, try, you know, I cross from above and below and connected the two. You can see from above, it's completely blocked from below. And we just kind of go towards each other. And there's a snare that that lasso pulled it through. And then I put a stent in. And you can see now flow. And he's now able to spend the remainder of time that he has, at least playing with his grandkids. And that was his one goal, you know, to be able to continue to whatever time he had on earth. Another patient of mine who used kind of older technology, you know, uh, this was years ago, who had a gangrene or a lot, and she was losing her, uh, getting death to her hand because she had such bad blood clot that it couldn't let the blood flow to her arm. It was such high pressure. So we used to what's called the AngioJet, and um, this is years ago. All this clot we were able to remove by a suction device and then balloon it, had flow, and you know she didn't have, a, she had pancreatic cancer and hypercoagulant syndrome, meaning she's more prone to developing clots. But the good thing is she was able to not have uh, profound problems with her hand and uh, was able to at least have it left and she was able to live with both her uh, hands. She developed clot elsewhere and ultimately uh, succumbed to her illness, but still it was pretty exciting to be able to do that for her. This is a patient who had a surgery for pancreatic mass. It was a, actually a benign mass ultimately, but 
he had, again, after surgery, complications occur. And this is a, can be a fatal complication where this is called the gastroduodenal artery and there's a little stump there. So I crossed it. You can see there's a little dissection here. And then as I'm doing it, the brush, blood pressure goes from 140, which is kind of normal to like 70. And he's starting to kind of get pale and sweaty. And um, so we know he's dying on our table. And we quickly go in and put in a cover graft. Again, these things, this technology and our skill set enables us to do things that we weren't. And he's still alive to this day. And so we put two grafts and you can see there's no more leakage and he survived. And that was maybe 10 years ago. So I still seen, I saw him about a year ago. He's doing great, cancer-free and uh, doing wonderful because he had a neuroendocrine tumor. We also do stuff in the veins. And I think uh, this is a professor, um, a PhD from a nearby university who couldn't walk, couldn't bicycle because his legs were like tree trunks. They were so swollen because he, he was backing up all the flow, wouldn't go to the heart. So we reconstructed his IVC and his iliac vein essentially got flow. And he was able to, uh, within about a month, he was able to bike again. He was able to walk. You could see his feet. They were so swollen, you couldn't see him. And now you could see his toes. It was pretty, pretty rewarding for a very highly functional um, uh, 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 PhD uh, professor. And you know, this is a kiddo who had a catheter that broke and flew to the heart from the neck. And uh, he had obviously had cancer surgery and needed the, you know, the catheter for chemo. And, you know, they were initially thinking, again, they were initially thinking, oh, we may have to open the heart to pull it out. But uh, luckily it was transferred to us and we were able to go through the groin vein. Again, it's all a highway through the heart, through the chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and use that lasso kind of like a cowboy and snare it out. Um, so what is VIR? It's throughout the human body, right? That's the beauty of it. And it's this is just a, a smattering of the surgeries that we do, okay? And it continues to expand. And I think that's anybody, you'll hear some of the stuff we're doing, but it, what we're going to be doing tomorrow is going to be even more, is, which is exciting. Treating hypertension, renal duration. Uh, we are in the midst of treating a lot of benign prosthetic hyperplasia. If you have a, a grandparent who can't go to the bathroom because they're blocked and they're having trouble, this is something we can offer them in a minimally invasive fashion. We're starting to get more and more role in treating arthritis. And again, aging population over 65, chronic conditions you're going to see. There's some treatment roles for obesity, treatment of hemorrhoids, so on and so forth. So what we've done is gone from a diagnostic field in the Seldinger era to an evolved clinical and therapeutic field with new training paradigms, new models of practice. We all have clinic with initial constants and logical care. Our residents do a lot of IC training and weekly clinic all six years. Beauty is we're getting more level one evidence. We are scientists. As scientists, we're in basic sciences. You need to study the hypotheses, the null method, and see what you do works because we need to improve safety and efficacy and durability for what we do. These are just a slew of the trials looking at uh, blockages of kidney arteries. Should we do it? Blockages of clots in the veins and the legs and the lungs. Should we fix it? Uh, osteoporotic compression fractures. Should we repair it? Again, fibroids. Should we do it? Which is better? Open hysterectomy, myomectomy, et cetera. So we're getting evidence to support what we do, which is important as scientists. Um, so minimally invasive, it's innovative, high end devices, super rapid evolving technology, expanding fields, all organs, variety of procedures, new applications. We're doing more prosthetic interventions, adrenal gland interventions, thyroid interventions, uh, joint interventions. And it's a unique combination of clinical expertise, technical skill set, and problem solving. So why VIR? It's minimally invasive and maximum effective. It's a future surgery now. If you're considering surgery or surgical subspecialty and you like the adrenaline rush, you know, I think it's great. It's technology driven. We're cowboys of medicine. Think on your feet and patient centered care. So it became a specialty because the American Board of Medical Specialties, the group of all doctors, says this is unique from radiology. This is a, a tremendous skill set and we need to promote it um, in a different fashion. And so, what are my tips for medical students? We'll talk more about it tomorrow. But find a mentor, shadow them. Do well in step one and two. Do well in surgery. Get a strong surgery letter. Worth year is important. Um, do three busy VR sub -eyes. Get an IC rotation, a vascular surgery rotation, and cardiology and stroke neurology rotations. A strong surgical internship, VR research and VR electives. Start a VIRIG, an independent VIRIG, not a radiology group interest group, but a vascular and ventral surgery interest group. Um, go to the SR meeting in Phoenix. Um, join SIR. It's free membership. We fought hard to make that free um, back in 2013. Um, 
And there's a slew of meetings, including the West Coast VIS and et cetera. So this is my email and cell phone. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.